We have begun a journey here uh, that began last week uh, talking about legacy and what that looks like in our lives and, and how it looks in a, in a biblical sense in our lives. Uh, Brian talked last week about how we leave what we live uh, and that our legacy is seen and left to those around us through how we live our lives today. Uh, that idea of how you live now is what you leave for those who will come after you. But today I want us to see the legacy that has been left for us through Christ. Uh, but before I begin with that, before I just jump right in, I've got to make sure that we understand what a legacy is. Uh, make sure that I define it properly for you. And the best way to do that is the dictionary. Uh, Webster's Dictionary defines legacy as this. Give me two, two definitions here. Something such as property or money that is received from someone who has died, or something transmitted by or received from an ancestor or predecessor or from the past. So that, that might look something like this. She left us a legacy of a million dollars. That's that first one. Uh, he left his children a legacy of love and respect. That's, that's the second. Make sense? We got legacy? Yeah? All right, everybody's here. All right, good. All right. The legacy, though, that we're focusing on today is, is one uh, of grace. Uh, and, and this is a gift that has been given to us by God through Jesus Christ. Uh, grace is defined as unmerited favor, or, as Brian has said many times, and I, I absolutely love the way he says it, grace is God giving us what we do not deserve, right? Grace is giving us what we do not deserve. Um, so, in order to understand what Jennifer read, uh, this, this letter to the Ephesians that, that Paul wrote, we've got to kind of understand what was this place that he was writing to, uh, the church of Ephesus. Um, to understand that, you've got to know this. Uh, the letter of Ephesians was written while Paul was in prison, uh, and he wrote this letter to a network of house churches in Western Asia Minor that were in and near Ephesus. Okay? Ephesus, I don't know how many of you have ever been there. Anybody ever been to Ephesus before? All right, so I'm going to tell you something you already know, maybe. Uh, for the rest of you, you're going to learn this kind of like I did. All right, Ephesus itself at that time was a very large, multi-ethnic center of trade, commerce, and culture. Uh, in the Greco-Roman world of the first century, Ephesus was only exceeded in population by Rome and Alexandria. Okay, we're talking about a large city here. Uh, it was capital city of the Roman province of Asia and had approximately a quarter of a million people in a very important seaport uh, there as well. Uh, in addition to having a significant Jewish community, Ephesus was home to many Greeks, Romans, and other settlers from throughout the entire Mediterranean world. And here's the thing, for me, when I think of Ephesus, uh, when I think of many of the places in the Bible, I think of small, dusty towns, dirt roads, camels, donkeys kind of tied up. You know, that's, that's just kind of this vision I have. Ephesus was nothing, nothing like that. What you have to imagine is a city with almost the same square miles as Baton Rouge, okay? Large city, uh, and in it a bustling harbor, pace, architecture, infrastructure of a large commercial cosmopolitan city. If you can kind of get that idea versus the one that I've always had, uh, you can kind of get an idea of what Ephesus might have looked like. But in addition to what it looked like, there was a culture that was unique to that city. It had many ethnic and cultural backgrounds. Different moral beliefs, like religious ones, were very diverse. Uh, there was a wide-ranging social acceptance that was maintained in the name of tolerance. They wanted everyone to just be okay with everything. Uh, and as a result, anyone claiming to have the right religion uh, or the only God or the ultimate truth was bound to face rejection, social pressure, or even persecution. And if you were one that just made it known in an overt way that you had the only answer, the only God, the only way, you might be tortured or even killed at the hands of your neighbor or the state. So that's Ephesus for us. That's where this church, a church that is preaching the only way, is beginning. So now that I've laid this background and kind of understand uh, this, this letter to the Ephesians, where they were and what this place was, I want us to focus really on what Paul has to say in verse 6. I think that's the key to this whole passage that, that Jennifer read for us. It says this, This mystery is that through the gospel, the Gentiles are heirs together with Israel, members together of one body, 
and shares together in the promise of Christ Jesus. Did you guys catch what that said? It's very important. It's huge. It's big information for all of us. That says that all of you, everyone, all of us, doesn't have to be excluded. We're all part of God's family. And because of Jesus Christ, we are, as it says, heirs together, sharing in a full inheritance as children of God, children of the Most High King. We're members together of the same body, uh, connected to each other. If, if you also know what Paul says in 1 Corinthians, he talks about how if one part of the body suffers, every part suffers with it. If one part is honored, every part rejoices with it. We're all part of the body of Christ. Individual members, but part of one body. And in addition, we are sharers together, sharing in the promise of the eternal, abundant, and exuberant life that is found only in Jesus Christ. We belong together. Jesus' legacy of grace has given each of us the greatest gift ever. It's a share in the inheritance of the kingdom of God. Now, I don't know if you guys are familiar with an inheritance. Uh, I, I am not too familiar with an inheritance. Uh, I looked up some things about it. I, I, I kind of know what it was, but haven't been through an inheritance as far as my family goes. Uh, but as I was reflecting on this passage and, and this part, I, I really thought about my story and how I came to be uh, part of the family that I'm a part of today. And I want to tell you guys about that family. Um, so for those of you who don't know, this lady right over here on the front row who I'm pointing out and making really uncomfortable right now is Kathy Harris. Uh, that's my mom. No applause, that's okay. Um, yeah, she's awesome. She's a great lady. Now, here's the thing. She and my dad uh, are not the parents I was born to. Uh, at 10 days old, I was taken home from the hospital in Fort Worth, Texas by John and Kathy Harris, and I was adopted into the Harris family. Uh, at that point, at 10 days old, and now through the rest of my life, I am a Harris. I do not know who I was before, and it doesn't matter because I've been made new. I'm part of this new family. It's a great family. I wish you could all be a part of it because it's that awesome. But what's great for us is we've all been adopted into a new family. We are all adopted into the family of God. Uh, that should be celebrated. That is a great gift for us. Uh, now, through this family of the Harrises, I have inherited a few things. Not financially, uh, not trucks yet, right? <laughs> Which my dad has a nice collection going. Uh, but I've inherited a few things. The, the, the number one thing I've inherited is a true understanding of the golden rule. Uh, it wasn't a week that went by that I didn't hear something about, you know, treat other people the way you want to be treated. Do unto others the way you want them to do unto you. Raise under that. And I've tried to live that out. I've also uh, inherited patience because, and I can say this because you're not here, if you live with my dad, you've got to be patient. He is a character. No amen from over there? All right. Um, and the other thing, which I've inherited from both of my parents, and if my wife was here, she'd attest to, is stubbornness, right? We are a stubborn bunch. We are set in our ways, uh, but that's, that's who I am. That's who I've inherited is being adopted into this family. But for us, we've been adopted, like I said, into God's family. And with that, we are supposed to inherit some certain traits. Uh, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, self-control, the fruit of the Spirit. Those are the things that we begin to inherit as part of God's family. And as we do that, our lives begin to change. We're no longer who we were before, before we had an encounter with Christ. Uh, our lives look different. And if we can understand and fully grasp that once we are part of this new family, that our lives look different because we're new people, we're a new creation, then it becomes really difficult to go through the day-to-day -day parts of our lives and talking to other people about ourselves, uh, about our family, our life, our blessings, our sufferings, work, school, ministry, whatever it might be, without also mentioning God as a part of what we do and how we live. Because with God and being part of that family, we are blessed. There are, there are gifts that, that show up in our lives, the gifts of friendship, the gifts of a place to gather and worship, 
uh, many, many things. And as heirs, we have another gift that, that Paul lifts up at the end of that section in verse, in verse 12. He says that in him and through faith in him, Christ, we may approach God with freedom and confidence. That's pretty awesome if you think about the God of the universe, the creator of all things, would like for us to just come up to him and have a conversation. Freely do that with full confidence that there is nothing, there's no barrier, there's no in-between, there's nothing that we have to do in order to approach him. We just have that because he is our father. That is a great gift, being invited into God's presence. And being able to approach him with freedom and confidence is, is a great uh, joy and gift as well. Uh, we were talking this morning in Sunday school about how uh, back in the day, as we've read in the Bible numerous times, in order to approach a king, and we're talking about here the king of the universe, you would have to be invited in. If you just approached the king without an invitation or just walked up to him, you would face punishment. You would, you would face possible death. But God welcomes us with open arms and invites us in every day. Uh, to to kind of maybe paint a picture for you guys of what this might look like. Some of you may be familiar with this picture. If you're not, that's okay. Um, but have any of you seen or remember the picture of President John F. Kennedy sitting at the Oval Office, the center of executive power in the United States, and curled up in the tiny inset of that huge desk was his little two-year-old son, little John John. You guys familiar with that? You've seen, you've seen that? Yes. Now, if you or I, if, if we had been invited into that office, we might have been a little bit nervous just to sit there and have a conversation with the president, right? Somebody who, who just commands such authority, uh, presence, and power. But his son was not afraid, not nervous, because the president wasn't the president to him. It was his dad. That's what we have. That's the family we've been adopted into. The ultimate power of the universe, the ruler of it all, says, come here. Just come talk. And, and Paul even goes further uh, when we look into the book of Hebrews, and he says this. Let us then approach the throne of grace with confidence so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. Just another example of how this family that we have been brought into, uh, brought into by the grace of God, it is one that we can approach any time with any trouble, with anything that is going on with us. There's nothing too small that God does not want to hear about. And this gift of grace, this, this legacy that Jesus has left for each of us, is greater than any heirloom that we might have in our family, anything that's been passed down from generation to generation, better than any Christmas gift we may have gotten a few weeks ago. I would dare say even better than winning the Powerball last night. Yeah? Or maybe, I don't know, better than winning it this Wednesday, right? Because this Wednesday is quite a bit of money coming up. But it's better than that. Because those things do not last. Uh, but what we're offered through Jesus lasts for eternity. Uh, things, money, stuff will all pass away. But the gift of eternal life will never fade. And when it comes to Jesus and his legacy, it's way more than the stories that we read in the Bible. It's more than him helping and, and establishing the church. It's more than teaching us just how to live and what to do and the right way to do things. His legacy was and is salvation for us all. That's the gift of grace. Jesus' death covered our sins. Jesus' resurrection defeated death. And through God's grace, we are heirs to the kingdom of God. We get to live into that kingdom. We are his children. The greatness of this gift, this legacy that has been left for us, should be reflected in our lives and how we live. Uh, if, if I reflect upon the, the legacy, the inheritance I've gotten from the Harrises, uh, some of my youth kids can attest I'm pretty patient. Um, my family can attest that I am very stubborn. Um, People who, who meet me in the street would probably, you know, understand that I live out the golden rule in my life every day. Those are the things that I have inherited, so that's how I live it out. But for us, if we are the inheritance of God's kingdom, that 
is what should be lived out day to day in our lives. That's what should be seen when we're not here. It should be reflected in our lives and how we live. It goes back to what Brian said last week. He said that we leave what we live. And if that's the case, then we certainly should be living in a way that shows the greatness of what we have all inherited through Christ, the gift of salvation. And it's something that should be shared to all so that they too might also inherit part of the kingdom. Uh, the, the, the best way to, to view this as far as how you live this out, uh, how you reflect the goodness of God in the world out there so that others might also be a part of this wonderful kingdom goes like this. It's something that I heard for years in high school from my dad, from my mom. I'm sure many of you have said to your own children or will say to your children someday, remember, when you go out there, when you're out on the roads, when you're with your friends, you're not just representing yourself, you're representing this family, right? Representing the Harris family. Well, for us, it goes beyond that. When we leave this building, when we go out there and we hit the streets and we go to school and we go to work, we go home, you're not just representing your family, you're representing God's family. That's, that's a big call to do, but you can do it. And if you ever have trouble trying to do that, remember that we can approach God with those struggles. He calls us just to come to him with anything that we might have. So now, as a fully understanding, adopted family of God, let us remember to go out there and represent God. Remember that the legacy that has been left for us is this wonderful gift of grace that Jesus has offered us as God's children, those who are heirs to the throne. I say all this in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen.